How's it going? Welcome everybody to Divine Concepts Automotive Design down here in Naples, Florida. Uh, I am Adam Divine and this is my submission for the 2024 Mobile Electronics Association Installer of the Year. Uh, for our main vehicle entry, it was tough. It was a tough decision. I had two that I'm kind of battling back and forth with because the builds are very similar. Uh, so our main ve build vehicle uh, will be uh, a client of our Benz. Uh, he came to us uh, probably about six months ago. Um, liked what we did, and our Porsche 911, or our I'm sorry, our Porsche 981 uh, demo car Kelly. Um, last year that we did for our top 12, he did a sound demo in there. Loved the sound in it, um, and. Basically showed him kind of the arts and crafts in the front. He fell in love with that. He fell in love with the sound. And uh, ideally, we were going to start with just sound. Um, he's got a 2015 911. Um, and it had the factory bow system in it. And it, it's up par. Just, just wasn't enough. Uh, the speakers, uh, we haven't changed yet in his car. Uh, we started with a Helix V12 amplifier. Um, he wanted kind of the same build out that we did in our 981. Uh, so we went with the Helix V12 and a Mobridge. Uh, and then he really just kind of wanted some arts and crafts. So he, he the parcel shelf pretty much behind uh, the, the rear seats in the back of the 911 is where we decided to put the amp. Um, so when we were going through the design process with them, we took a couple photos. Uh, I was able to go into Procreate, kind of just sketch up what I felt was going to kind of take up, how much space we were going to take up on that parcel shelf. Um, there was about a three to four inch kind of lip, and I was trying to stay underneath that, uh, right on the back part of the panel. Uh, so everything kind of would nest and look uh, OEM. We're, we're going for an OEM look and feel for it. Uh, so... With his 2015 911, he's got a lot of Alcantara in there, black leather, uh, some deviated straight stitch. He has some yellow contrast. Uh, so for the design process, we kind of went back and forth a little bit. Uh, I showed him some sketches in Procreate, some uh, some ideas and uh, vectors that I drew up in uh, Shaper 3D or um, uh, just back end Lightburn. Uh, and we kind of landed on a idea design concept of uh, mounting, you know, where it was kind of a tough, it was a lot of real estate, uh, that rear parcel shelf for one V12 amp and to highlight it and make it look cool, but look OEM at the same time uh, was a little bit more challenging. So we were kind of minimalist, but clean. Um, so what we decided to do is it was the month of might have been July. Um, these months go so quick. Uh, was the month of Porsche's 75th anniversary. And part of their 75th anniversary, Porsche introduced a brand new logo, a uh, brand new badge. Uh, they got rid of kind of like the stipling that's in the, the middle of the logo. Um, and actually, I might even have one up here. Uh, so actually, they got rid of a lot of this stipling in here, in this area here. Uh, same thing in the red area here, and they switched over to a hexa uh, hexagon pattern in there. Uh, so we thought it would be really cool to uh, incorporate that 75th anniversary logo. Uh, but at the time, even Porsche really hasn't made one. There was a rendering of it, uh, so we had to design that from scratch. Um, uh, so we decided on utilizing uh, a plethora of different materials uh, from Alcantara. Um, a, um, like an anthracite gray is going to be the closest usually to the, the, the factory Porsche color. Uh, either it's dead on or just maybe a shade. It all depends on how really the client kept the car for the past five, six, seven years. They haven't really changed much. Um, but we were able to find like a yellow Alcantara as well for our contrast. Um, and then we did uh, some contrasting stitching. Um, but let's start getting into the build. So the system design really just kind of came from a correspondence back and forth between me and him. Um, shooting photos back and forth, sketching little things over it. Um, our system design process kind of worked the same uh, with our secondary vehicle, which highlights a lot of our build attributes, 
which we just finished up uh, literally last week, uh, is a 2024 BMW Alpina B7. Um, and it's absolutely beautiful. Brand new vehicle. He brought it to us with less than 100 miles on it. Had um, That one was a little bit more of a challenge. Um, but we, we he... For our design process for his vehicle, uh, he loved the giant I, the idea of the giant logo, the giant logo in the vehicle. Uh, so we decided to for his vehicle to do a similar kind of build, but with the Alpina logo, um, and then kind of nest it into the floor. So you'll see a lot of attributes um, from the Porsche build go into the BMW build and vice versa. Um, so let's start getting into the actual build. All right. So getting into the actual build process of the vehicle. Um, when we have a client drop off a build, uh, of this nature, uh, it's usually something that's going to stay with us for a little bit. Uh, so we request from them to have the exterior of the vehicle at, at least washed and cleaned and free of any dirt or debris. Um, because the first thing that we do after bringing the vehicle into our bay, doing a thorough check-in using our shop monkey, in check-in procedure, it doesn't matter if it's a brand new vehicle or an older one, everything gets checked in. Uh, after our check-in, we will go through uh, and address anything that we found with a client, but after that, we will go right into interior and exterior uh, protection films. Uh, so whether it's JK Tapes or Tessa, we're going to go through an exterior uh, wrap uh, any of the panels that we may come in contact with. So door sills, door edges, door handles, um, C pillars, trunk lids, hoods, hood latches, fenders, uh, doesn't matter. You know, we're going to pretty much cover the vehicle anywhere we may possibly touch it, or it has the capability of getting a, a scratch or a scuff or anything to that nature. We want that vehicle to leave just as pristine as it came in. Uh, same thing goes for the interior. Uh, the interior protection film will go down on only areas that we don't remove. Uh, part of our installation and build process and what we do uh, is after taking care of really the exterior of the vehicle and the interior of the vehicle, our next step in our process is really gutting it. Um, over the years, you, we've noticed that uh, the thought of... Uh, not fully removing a panel to try and tuck and you know move a wire or this that or the other uh is not a time saver um we take the time to just disassemble everything that could potentially be in our way um so that way we can actually see the layout and the architecture and the the system and electrical design of the vehicle manufacturer so that, that way when we're doing our clean wire management and we're making our wire runs um, we don't run into any potential pitfalls. Let's say a high voltage line is, is somewhere tucked away and hidden and you, you throw an audio signal cable over it. Um, that methodology and having everything kind of just stripped, cleaned, out of the way, uh, makes sure that uh, when we dress and do all of our wiring, it's going to run just in line with all the other factory wiring. All the other panels will be able to get back, put back onto the vehicle snugly securely you're not going to have a bulge or something like that and not be able to put a you know panel back on because there's too much wire underneath there um so taking that time is is something that's huge for us and making sure that it's done and done right in terms of all the the hardware um when we remove all the interior panels from the vehicle all of the hardware actually gets stored in um these translucent tackle boxes from harbor freight we probably got a couple dozen of them uh, as we remove door panels, C panels, uh, or C pillars, A pillars, um, we'll go through and wrap all of those individual panels and movers blankets and make sure that they're stored over in the paint booth or on shelving and away from the vehicle. All the corresponding hardware that goes with those panels, um, we would take one of those tackle boxes, utilize a dry erase marker, uh, and you know separate all the little modular compartments right on the dry erase on the top of the lid and say exactly where the hardware came from and leave it with the panel. Uh, that's why we have a ton of these boxes. Um, and it makes it really, really simple for uh, reassembly when we're done. Uh, there is no hunting or some random screw that you're not sure where it came from. Uh, everything that got disassembled has a tackle box attached to it, and we know exactly where it came from and where it should go and what part of the panel it should go on. And then at the end of the day... A little bit of uh, isopropyl alcohol and a uh, uh, 
paper towel or microfiber, wipe off all the front of the dry erase boxes, and we're on to the next build. So that's how we start our build process into the bay here. So let's talk about what's going in uh, to the Porsche uh, as well as the, the BMW that we'll throw back and forth. So in Ben's uh, Porsche 911 Turbo S 2015, um, we decided the Helix V12 was the best suit based off of uh, Kelly and our demo car. Uh, we also did a RDV wireless CarPlay module to his factory PCM, a Echo Master PCAM 201, uh, for a front lip camera, uh, as the parking stones down here uh, destroy Porsches left and right. We see them quite a bit. Um, as well as a Mobridge DA1 uh, to get our optical signal back to the Helix V12 up on um, the rear parcel shelf. Now, the whole uh, design behind Benz uh, was the giant Porsche logo. Um, and we wanted to do that 75th anniversary logo, so uh, we had to redesign it build it, uh, do a whole vector literally from scratch in Lightburn. So in the BMW, uh, in Kent's BMW Alpina, uh, what we installed in there are going to be two Hertz milli 10-inch uh, woofers, uh, two Helix M1X amplifiers, a LC2i distribution block, um, and all of that went literally underneath the spare tire area under the third row. Uh, we were able to actually utilize our 3D scanner to make sure that everything was going to fit under there beforehand. Uh, it was kind of a 20-pound ham, 5-pound bag situation, um, but we were able to make it happen. So uh, Kent's build came out of Ben's build, more or less. Uh, Kent ended up seeing Ben's build. Loved the giant logo idea and wanted to run with it on his. So we started with Ben's, um, and to get the giant logo, um, the first way we, we started the build off after we get a, the whole interior is we just kind of taped off a section of our outfeeder table uh, to the proportions of what that rear parcel shelf was. And then we threw the Helix V12 on top of there and kind of looked at the size. Um, you know, we can do a lot of that stuff digitally, but sometimes having an actual tangible res representation in front of you and and having it mocked up in front of you it's a little bit easier to to understand um so we got it up on the on the outfeed table we did all the design work and shaper 3d to recreate the 75th anniversary logo down to the number of hex squares going up and down and number of rows sideways uh to the best of our ability to match that as perfect as we can um, we then exported it and decided on our colors um, and color scheme between the yellows, the, the gray, the black, what's going to light up, what's not going to light up. Uh, and then we had to try and figure out how are we going to build this kind of acrylic sign, more or less, and then only have portions of it line up. Um, so we brought it over to the laser and just literally started inventing and cutting out pieces and mocking it up. Um, and instead of building uh, just a shield logo, uh, I decided to oversize it and give myself more space or more mounting material so that way we could nest magnets into the edges uh, so it keep every eighth inch acrylic layer kind of in line and keep a lot of the oh, kind of puzzle pieces at this point from jiggling and rattling around in there without having to acrylic cement down every single little piece. Um, plus we were unsure if the acrylic cement would dry and we would see, uh, any residue or residuals from the acrylic cement underneath it. Um, everything basically got nested and then we had to find out a way to light it. So the way we figured out how to light it was we made the, uh, complete bottom panel, uh, just uh, three eighths inch, uh, cast, uh, clear acrylic. Uh, we left the paper on it and only rastered out the areas where we wanted the light to shine upwards uh, up into our giant logo, uh, which worked for us really well. And we decided to leave all the rest of the corresponding uh, paper still on there just to help tone down any light bleed that may come in between um, just from the kerf of the actual laser cutting out the layers in different colors. Um, and it came out absolutely phenomenal. Um, but we wanted to nest 
um, the logo kind of and give some depth. Um, so for our top plate, we decided to use uh, expanded PVC and do it a pretty substantial chamfer down um, to uh, the actual Porsche logo. Um, and to create some type of, um, I guess, pattern or design to the top plate, then other than just having the logo, we decided to make three separate panels by offsetting the actually factory logo. So when the, we took the crest and then offset it out, that created our perimeter for our center panel and ultimately our outer wings, which we copied that same uh, uh, method on the Alpina uh, to move the Alpina symbol and give us from the Dynica in the center to the cream leather on the sides to the, the gray leather on the, the far wings. Um, Another method that we employed on both installs is both installs have simulated French seams. Um, so uh, both top panels are nested with a plethora of magnets, which help secure and keep all of our uh, top panels in place. Uh, we've found that using a, a quarter inch ultralight uh, as our top beauty panel uh, and then covering it in uh, like a scrim foam or so foam um, when we're utilizing our unbacked Alcantara just gives it a little bit of plush. Um, it, it's still a hard foam. It's not like a, an, a squishy headliner so foam, but it gives it just enough, a little bit of dimple and plush that allows the fibers to really kind of stand and be able to move around. We found that if you use the unbacked Alcantara on just a straight substrate, it it just doesn't look like it should. It doesn't act like it should. It shouldn't respond when you touch it like it should. So uh, those are little things that we've learned over the years in, in playing with upholstery and getting better at trimming. Um, in the uh, BMW, or actually, no, I'm sorry, in the Porsche, uh, the first time I stitched up the yellow insert in the center, um, the stitch lines were just a little bit too far apart. Um, when I added the exterior wings with the anthracite gray Alcantara, that I decided to go and cut it all off and redo it again. Um, the one thing that's nice about uh, working with stitching and trimming is it gives you a little bit more leeway to go back and rewrap uh, if you just kind of edge seam. And that's kind of what I did is uh, to lay down my stitch line, I just use my Landau top and trim adhesive just on my stitch line, laid it out onto the, the foam, planted, got my uh, stitch line nested really, really tight, and then allowed me to stretch the fabric and then just glue on my rabbited back trim uh, on the back. Now, all of our panels are dressed on the front and the back. Um, they're painted on the back, uh, just like they are on the front, um, as well as everything's inlaid, rabbited, tucked. Uh, so it's giving a factory finish front and back, uh, whether it's on the Porsche, the BMW that we did, or any of the panels that we make going forward. We always try to dress both sides because um, it just shows the pro professionalism of what you're doing and the love for your craft and, and, it's how it really should be done. Uh, and you're, you're, you're taking a client of this caliber and you're building on something that's one off that you want to be proud of. Um, be proud of all the stuff that's hiding behind the scenes for it. Uh, so with Ben, he wanted his Porsche, uh, system in the back to be kind of modular in case he had to go to the track. Uh, he does race the 911 turbo S up at Sebring every once in a while. Um, so for the rear parcel plate, uh, substrate, we were able to take the factory D rings out of the parcel plate and mount our bottom substrate to those M6, uh, threaded bosses right on the, the rear parcel shelf, which gave us a solid foundation for everything moving forward. Uh, we used some fairing strips to create uh, a false floor to give us enough height. Uh, to allow the amp to sit there and then allow to us to put our top plate on. Uh, since a lot of Porsche enthusiasts, Ben included, uh, does not like um, any of their wires to be cut, chopped, spliced, uh, or, or gutted of any nature, and since we know, because having the 9081 and being part of the Paradise Region Group, 
uh, we found ways around that. So um, through Mauser, we were able to get and source the factory Bose header cards um, that would have been inside the guts of the factory amplifier. That allowed us to create a uh, piano black mounting plate for underneath the passenger seat here to mount our Mobridge DA-1-2 um, and then create our own factory harness that would plug right into their factory harness um, without splicing, cutting, uh, anything at all. Uh, this allowed us to follow the factory loom back up to the parcel shelf um, where we once again used uh, in-house made Molex plugs so that way the whole... Uh, the whole piece can be taken out. Uh, we have a heavy gauge one for our four gauge run. We have smaller Molex, 16 pin uh, Molex for the rest of the speaker wires and signal cables. Um, but it made for a really nice, easy modular design to either take in, take out, uh, or revert 100% back to factory. So when we talk about uh, troubleshooting and running into sticky situations, um, troubleshooting is usually probably everybody's most hatred. Uh, for me, I absolutely enjoy it. Um, being a huge nerd and advocate of the MECP program for years and just a sucker for more knowledge day in and day out, um, I, I like a challenge. I like, I like being able to figure out complex problems. Uh, and oddly enough, both of these two vehicles were two that uh, gave me some weird, funky problem uh, that if I wasn't good at troubleshooting, uh, the one I, I could have fixed. The other one, there's no way I could have fixed it without a phone call. So the first one was with Ben's uh, Porsche. Uh, just like every great build, you know, we're on the, uh, the home stretch. Cars pretty much back together. We're getting ready to, to, to run the tune. And for some reason, my optical audio signal is not coming out of my Mobridge. And um, checked all the settings. Everything looked right. Uh, checked the software. That looked right. Um, checked for a bend in the fiber optic. That's all fine. Um, reverse it. Pop our uh, Mobridge out. Put the factory amp back in because we made a quick disconnect. We have audio. Um, doesn't make any sense. Uh, I had two Mobridge DA1s in stock, so I went ahead and grabbed another one. You know, same thing, but no audio. Uh, you know, so I, I did what uh, anybody would do when they, they hit the wall. You know, you phone your friend. You know, you, that's part of your networking. And, and you know, you reach out to your landline and, you know, your lifeline. And I, I reached out to Mr. Chris Van Rye up at MSC, and I asked him, you know, I said, you know, I got two DA1s, both doing the same thing, all going in this V12. I got no audio signal. Um, no pinch optical, you know, n nothing seems right. And it, it just seems locked. Like I can't figure it out. And he went over everything with me and he's like, no, but I agree with you. Both the units seem locked up. I don't, I'm, he's like, call the guys at Mobridge. He's, and I'm like, well, nobody's going to be up. And he's like, they're Australia. So yeah, call them like they'll answer. I'm like, all right, right on. So I call up, you know, it's like 11 o'clock at night here, and, and I call up, and I get the good day, mate, you know, and uh, I, I explain to him the situation and what's going on, and he thinks it's a hoot. He starts laughing, you know. He's like, oh, all right, man. He's like, yeah, yeah, they're locked down. Yeah, uh, it was a bad batch. We got on return. We had locked them all down for a manufacturer, and uh, we forgot to unlock them, and a few of them got out. Uh Give me a couple minutes. Uh, I'll send you over the file. It'll unlock it. So, uh, needless to say, about 15 minutes later, one email, um, a reflash of the Mobridge, and we were back in business and rocking and rolling. Uh, the BMW troubleshoot that uh, started uh, making us all kind of crazy, and it was just because um, tired lack of observation, you name it. Uh, we kept having the car wake up inexplicably for no reason. Uh, and, you know, obviously we're working around the trunk area of the, the vehicle and the Alpina to, to trim everything out and get everything nested up in the tire well. Um, but the Alpina has the, the lower flap, and since it was already covered with exterior protection film, uh, we didn't notice that one of our belt loops or, you know, a belt buckle or something just kept touching the button back behind the clinger app 
and waking the car back up. So we're thinking that, you know, what's going on? Every time we get close to this car, it wakes back up. Every time we're just looking at it, it's waking back up. You know, what's going on? And then uh, I, I... I felt the click, or I, I just somehow it clicked in my head, and I peeled back the wrap to take a peek, and, and sure enough, uh, we were just lining ourselves up in a bad position to to knock that switch every time and kind of rewake the car back up. Uh, so it's just reverse engineering stuff, silly things. Um, but the more you dedicate to your your knowledge, education, and and being able to reverse engineer stuff will help you find those little problematic things a lot faster, a lot simpler. There are going to be times where it bites you in the butt, and it, it, it has me. Um, but like I said, I, I'm a, a weird one. I actually enjoy them. So uh, for our fabrication portion, we we kind of did that through out um but um i'm gonna go through and we'll go into the finish and final photos of the build um and uh show you a couple more uh we have tons and tons of photos we'll we'll stitch a bunch of them together to show you more uh fabrication photos that led up to the the final panel um the uh the Porsche, I'd still say we don't have a really good final photo on it because it, it, it's really hard to get through the tent and and get a good angle on it. We're waiting uh, for our photographer, Ruben uh, Torres, who's uh, the gentleman from Paradise Region Group who does all of our artwork over on Side 10, um, to, to have the right lenses and the right cameras to take good final photos of it. Uh, same thing with the Alpina. As you guys know, um, when you're working with LEDs, it... You have to have the right filters and right lenses on top uh, to make lighting look right. Um, and although I'm a good technician and a good installer, I may not be the best photographer. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you have to leave that in the hands of the people who do it every day, just like we leave uh, our clients leave their vehicle in our hands every day. So, um Going forward, you're going to go through and you're going to see uh, the progression photos uh, back to back for the Porsche uh, buildup uh, going into the Alpina buildup uh, of all the uh, interlocking panels and laser designs and, and, and pieces that all came together to, to stack all these layers up to make this, in, in, in my opinion, like a cool art piece. Because uh, that's really what we're doing. You know, the, these these vehicles are canvases. You know, we're all artists and engineers, and and, and you know, uh, that that's our canvas, and we're we're the artists, and we got our paintbrush. So we we got to get out there and and make something one off, make something cool, make something unique and fun. Uh, and it was an absolute blast getting to do both of these vehicles. Uh, with having so much similarities between the two um, build structures, um, one being only an amplifier in arts and crafts, the other one being amp and subs in arts and crafts, but but kind of unique stylings and OEM stylings between the two was a really fun back to back, and uh, we'll we'll probably get them both together uh, when we do an event here uh, at the shop. Um, we we do two three nine cars and coffee, um, but a lot of times, like in our, our retail video, we're not the earliest arisers on the weekend, uh, except for Wesley. So maybe we're thinking of uh, autos and tacos or something, and and do something for brunch or uh, midday. Um, but I hope you guys enjoyed all the fabrication, the photos, the kind of the behind the scenes portion, and uh, we'll kick it into the personal interview. All right, judges, the time has come. We're at the end, the personal interview. Uh, I'm sure you are very excited to stop hearing me talk. So um, my personal and professional evolution over the last year has absolutely been astronomical. From the growth with inside the business, the changes that we've made, the remodels, the renovations, um, being bestowed honorary expert or master, you know, whichever way you want to look at it through MECP, um, hiring three, three people to the team. Um, I, I mean, I just couldn't be more excited and more thrilled, uh, about the progress going on here at divine concepts, automotive design and the team that we've established. Um, 
education that I've done in the past year to better my craft, I actually um, uh, went and got certified for the MECP Security and Convenience Specialist, a uh, new certification that just popped out. You guys know me, MECP. Uh, the certifications are like Pokemon cards. I got to collect them all, right? Because um, knowledge is power. It's only going to make my job easier. It's only going to help me pr- make my team better, uh, help troubleshoot, diagnose, fix issues, turn cars, get more clients in, have better clients' experience. You you uh, you hear me parrot the same thing year after year. So. Um, you know, I'm super, super stoked about uh, the educational uh, trajectory for my new guys going forward, um, attending Knowledge Fest, conventions, expos, manufacturers, trainings, you name it. We're, we're deep diving all of them. Uh, they don't have a choice. Uh, if I'm loving it and I'm passionate, guess what? You're coming with me. Uh, we'll lock down shop. We're going to go learn together. If they can't, then you know what? We'll, we'll have them tend the house we'll go train and come coach it back um but man we're pumped ready for the next round um my role with inside the store and the impact i've had on my fellow employees and the business in general uh well being the owner um i feel like i have a pretty substantial impact um you know i'm i'm the captain in the ship uh I, i have to make sure that all my crew is in the right spot at the right time and that they're really casted correctly. Um, you know, uh, in my retailer one, I, I spoke of Isaac, who came in originally as an apprentice for a technician. Uh, and he'll still end up being a technician at one point in time. He can still get his hands dirty, but he doesn't have as much time with hands-on tools. Um, he was up here as a sales pro. He dominates the house. Um, so really deep diving with your your employees and having those one-on-one conversations and finding what they're good at and, you know, finding what drives and motivates them, not just the position that you think they should be in, um, is really what my focus is and what I've been doing inside my business. Um, as I said earlier, you know, I, I've taken a short hiatus or break from the, the social media aspect just from the sheer fact that I have to focus on my guys and focus on my brand and focus on my business. As much as I love networking and being in social media and being in group chats, um, the, the priority here is in-house. It has to come first. Um, and I hope you guys all should feel that same way, you know, because since we did that, we've seen substantial growth from it. Um, we're too busy to actually get on social media, which is a great thing. Um, but you know, without a social media presence, you know, you're, if you don't have word of mouth traffic that could taper off as well. So, um, it's a double edged sword and we have to have balance, but my roles and responsibilities are to make sure that the ship is smooth sailing, that everybody is comfortable in their role and position and that their training, education, and content are 100% up to par. Um, and I feel that we're, we're executing on all cylinders for that. Um, and uh, finally, the, the toughest question once again, uh, finally, why do I believe I should be installer of the year and represent our industry as one of the best installers? Um, that's always... a Super, super difficult question, but uh, in all honesty, in 26 years, um, my my biggest, I'd say, Achilles heel as being a super tech and super nerd, um, and it wouldn't be an Achilles heel, it's just, you know, something that I haven't been as well refined as many as in, in fabrication. Um, so I made it a point on my video last year to wholeheartedly spend this whole year deep diving into fabrication so whether it be 3d modeling working on my laser woodworking working with pvc acrylics composites um but really doing a lot more big fab builds in-house um like the alpina we've got an m4 coming up we have aston martins coming up we have leather hides in the house now um, we are doing so much more fab and trimming and upholstery and woodworking. And it took me stepping outside my comfort zone. Uh, and that was the last piece in my personal puzzle that I felt that was lacking me getting to that, that next level. 
Um, and now that I've kind of crushed that inside me, there's nothing I can't build. I, I may not be able to build it as quick as, you know, the, the greats in our industry that, uh, that have come before me, but I could build it just as good. Uh, it may take me longer, but there, there's no stopping me. So there, no matter what you want me to build, design, fabricate, I can reverse engineer anything, I can build anything, and I can figure out anything. And the best part about it is I'll share it with anybody. And that's what needs to happen for somebody to be the installer of the year. They have to be the face of our industry. And people can't be intimidated to reach out to help from them, right? And I want to be that person. I want to be that person um, just as I have after Retailer or just as I have after Trusted Tech to be that support system for the rest of the industry and be the face, the face to say that, you know, this is what good looks like. This is what passion is. This is what inspiration is. And this is how you can benefit, impact your team in the back, impact your team on the sales floor and impact the culture of the whole industry. And I feel that I have pushed forward. I've never stepped off the gas and if you give me the opportunity, this won't be the rest of me. You know, uh, just I, I didn't stop after winning anything else, and I wouldn't stop after winning this. I'd only be more humble, more prideful, and be more eager to help everybody else out. So best of luck to everybody. Thank you to Chris Cook, MEA, Rich Bassler, the whole mobile electronics association and team out there all of you guys and gals that make all of this possible the reps retailers everybody love you guys all can't wait to see everybody in vegas full team in tow hopefully pup can make it as well love you guys see you in vegas so i know i said that we're done and we're over and it was all fun stuff um but something really serious and really near and dear to me, um, as you guys may and may not know, our industry lost an amazing man, Mr. Todd Ramsey. Uh, he, for those of you who don't know me personally, uh, Todd was the man who brought me into this world. Um, I went to Mobile Dynamics back in 2001, and... Uh, got my installer and first class and uh started as an instructor became a friend lifelong mentor and uh he's gonna be missed big time you know uh he did so much for this industry and uh I only hope that I make him proud and follow in his footsteps. And uh, I want to dedicate my submission this year to my friend, Mr. Todd Ramsey. Love you, buddy. See you.